Hello, I'm Steve and welcome to Castle Rock State Park. I will be hosting today's episode. Right now we are at the north entrance of the park and behind me stands St. Peter Sandstone. It is April 30th, about 60 degrees out and very, very windy, so I hope you can hear me above the wind. Um, but we're here today not so much for the lithology and, and the St. Peter as we are for something else. Right here begins an 80 mile long fault that extends here from Ogle County all the way to Will County, Illinois. It trends east, southeast. Now this fault zone doesn't get any attention unlike the New Madrid because it's not active and for most of its length it's covered by glacial deposits. Here we see some excellent outcrops of, of what has been faulted and we are going to stop at two stops today that show this faulting. Now on small scale maps, the Sandwich Fault Zone is mapped as a single line running from Ogle County all the way to Will County. But in reality, it's a fault zone. It's one to two miles in width and there's complex faulting just throughout the whole thing. You have normal faults, reverse faults, thrust faults. You just have a whole myriad of things. And that's key to understanding this thing because that tells us that this fault zone was active at more than one point in history. Now as for age, younger than Silurian, older than Quaternary. The entire block of time between there is eroded in the fault zone area. So we don't know for sure. Now just to the west of me, about 10 miles or so, is something called the Plum River Fault Zone. Now that fault is 112 miles in length and extends from Ogle County through central Iowa. Now there's debate whether or not these two connect, and if they do, then they are one of the single most, if not the longest trending fault in the Midwest. They'd be almost 200 miles in length. Now the Plum River, we know a lot better the age because we see faulting in some of the Devonian and Pennsylvanian. So that makes this late Paleozoic, at least the Plum River. Now, as for another age, all we can do is guess. Using what we know about the tectonic history of the planet Earth at the time, we can start to assemble a better picture. Um, this has to be, this fault zone has to be significantly younger than Silurian because the rocks were already lithified hard at the time, the Silurian rocks. So we could be looking at Pennsylvania, but what was going on then? Well, you had the formation of the supercontinent Pangaea. And by the early Triassic, that continent began to break apart. So, this, so these fault zones probably began to be formed during the assemblage of Pangaea and were activated many, many times throughout geologic history as the continent began to break up and form the modern continents we see today. Now, I tend to believe that the Sandwich Fault Zone may be Permian to early Triassic in age. And the reason for this being most of the deformed Paleozoic rocks on the Plum River Fault Zone start near the west edge of the fault. So what may have happened is you have, is you, as you had the Plum River Fault Zone forming, slowly as time went on, the faulting started to progress eastward. So that would support a late Paleozoic, early Mesozoic age for the Sandwich Fault Zone. Now there is a possibility that the two form simultaneously. Um, whether or not they connect would be a key indicator of understanding the two fault zones. If they do not connect, then a late Paleozoic, early Mesozoic age is probably most likely because that coincides with the breakup of Pangaea. Now I want to show you the faults at two stops today. They are actually just outside the park. Um, most of the rocks within the park are covered or you would get the hills and the outcrops of the St. Peter like you see behind me with a little bit of Platteville on top. But we, what we are going to look at is much older at the first stop. It's Cambrian in age. This stuff is Ordovician. And at the second stop we're going to look at the St. Peter but something happens very interesting where we're going to go. The second stop is Devil's Backbone. So I look forward to having you on the journey today and let's get started.
off one. Now the picture I just showed you before this is a zoom out of this rock outcrop behind me. Now the reason why I did that is because I am along US 2. I am on the west side southbound of the road and right behind me about 100 feet or so is the Rock River and it's because of this river the Rock River that we have this excellent exposure in this area. Now this is actually a road cut that you see behind me and this is significant I mean right off the bat you can see how this sags in the middle okay now just to the north and just to the south this sag is not there okay now if we look at these rocks in detail we look closely at these rocks they're carbonate but there's something interesting about the carbonate I'll see if I can find a piece here for you to show you okay the carbonate here you can see by the color it's kind of yellowish orange and it looks almost sandy like a sandstone but it's not it's a carbonate and what this is if you look at this in hand lens what you see is rhombohedral dolomite crystals, small ones, uh, less than a millimeter in diameter. Now that's key in understanding what's going on here, because this carbonate is very pure with the exception of, there's some chert right here. This chert is also very pure. Now, back to the rhombohedral crystals. Uh, so, what would form these rhombohedral crystals? Obviously they can't be primary, they weren't deposited as crystals in a sea bottom. They would have had to have changed over time for some reason. And the sag is another clue. This sag does dip towards the west a little bit. And if we go due east of here, northeast, is the same type of rock, but it dips slightly east. Now, there's a certain kind of structure that can do that. Okay, but before we get there, we know that there's faults here, and it's made up of a lot of little smaller faults within it. Now, if you first glance, you look at this, and there's nothing to the north, significantly, or to the south, you would assume that what happened here is you had extension, and the rocks split, and this middle part dropped down. It's called a graben. It's a small, it would be a small graben. And the sagging beds in the middle would point as to evidence for that. But we have a problem with that assumption. Uh, like I said, to the east, you see the same rock outcrop, but they dip overall to the east. Here they dip a little bit to the west. And there's another problem. In between those two areas, somebody drilled for a water well, to install a water well. And a few hundred feet down, they hit the green sand. The same kind of stuff we've explored at West Salem, Wisconsin. It's the exact same age. So if this was an actual small grobin, you split in your fall, we would expect this to be Galena Platteville and we should see St. Peter, but the St. Peter is several hundred feet thick in the area. So, at a couple hundred feet down, you hit the Cambrian green sands, that doesn't make any sense. Well, it does if this is not a grobin. What most likely happened here, a small thrust fault. And basically, what a thrust fault is, it's a low angle reverse fault. So if my hands represent the flat surface here and a layer of rock, when we get a thrust fault, what happens is this is going to become my fault plane. This is where the breakage is going to occur. We get compressional stresses that push one side up and they begin to bend and then eventually break and go over our fault plane. And if we have this drop down here dipping west and in Loden we have east dipping, that explains it. And it also explains this dip here in the middle because this thrust fault wasn't independent or regional. It was bounded on the side, so you have so you have your thrust fault, and then on the sides you had solid rock, so you had strike slip movement as well. And that strike slip movement would create this dip. So here, although we don't see the sandwich fault zone directly, we can infer what happened from this outcrop and well records. Now, the, our second stop, our next stop, we see the Sandwich Fault Zone in action and have direct evidence of its work. 